Okay, uh, uh, just wanted to thank um, Brother Ozan for giving me an opportunity to uh, do a continuation of a part two. Um, for those who um, didn't get the first uh, part of the lesson, we uh, had a, um, it wasn't a, a mixture of, of the whole class setting as a whole, we, we had to go and uh, separate to go to the just all men's teaching class and the women had the forum on last Sunday so so for those who didn't really get the first part of it I just want to do a recap and just go back over what uh, was discussed on last Sunday well, what I was talking about was dealing with various baptisms um, that are in the Bible and uh, I mentioned several types of baptism that the Bible talks about. Yes, okay. Uh, the title is uh, There are various baptisms that are in the Bible. Uh, which baptism did you receive? That was the uh, first part of the lesson on last Sunday. And so, what I want to do is just give a recap of, of what. I went over on last week dealing with these uh, various types of baptisms uh, that the Bible talks about. So, uh, the scripture I started out with was Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, and it explains uh, some disciples that Paul had met uh, in Ephesus, and he uh, was asking them questions. Uh, and he wanted to know if they had received the Holy Spirit uh, since they believed um, when they heard the message of John's uh, baptism which he preached in the wilderness which uh, was the baptism of repentance so John was sent by the prophet Isaiah uh, to prepare the believing Jews for the coming of Christ. And so John's mission was to prepare the way. He did baptize as well, but his baptism was, was water baptism. But he said that there will be one that will come after him that's more mighty than he is and that he is not worthy to fill the shoes of Jesus who he's referring to and he said that he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and he also mentions and with fire and so the recap that Paul asked questions to see where they were at in terms of uh, their salvation. Um, and he asked them, did they receive the Holy Spirit since they believed? What did they believe? They believed in John's baptism, the belief that it was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So they, they believed after they came and gathered to the Jordan River to hear the preaching of John the Baptist. So it convince many to gather to come to hear his teaching and many of them were convinced when they heard John's message and they believed and they were baptized under John's uh, baptism so this was before Jesus came because John said himself he was urging these Jews to repent for the remission of sins and the reason why he's telling them that is because he says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand so the kingdom of heaven is referring to that jesus is the coming messiah that 
Isaiah that John the Baptist had spoken of concerning the one that would come after him. He was speaking of Jesus. And so that prophecy had to be fulfilled. He had to fulfill the prophecy of his father. So Jesus was going to fulfill and complete uh, what was being prophesied through the prophet Isaiah. And so Paul come to realize that some of these disciples that he had, had met with didn't receive the Holy Spirit. And since they haven't, he had to lay hands on them so that they could receive uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, they only heard of John's baptism. So they believed and repented for the remission of sins, which was the baptism of repentance. So John the Baptist had taught them, so that's all they knew. That's all they focused on was the baptism of repentance. So I talked about that and they received the Spirit of God. In Luke's gospel account from the laying of hands in which Paul did. So the Lord was, while he was with his disciples, he spoke to them concerning the things that must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and of the prophets and the Psalms concerning himself. And that he explained what those things are to help them to understand that it is written and necessary for him to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So Jesus is, is speaking of his resurrection and the promise of his father is upon them and for them to tarry in Jerusalem until they will be endued with the power from on high. And the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now, that was a, a question that was asked on last Sunday uh, because there are some religious beliefs that don't believe that um, you receive the Spirit of God. And uh, the question was, because this is what some denominational religions will ask, they'll ask questions to see what you know. Mm -hmm. And they'll try to use what you don't know to say that you don't know the Bible, you, you're a liar. You don't have proof of what you're saying. And so the question was, what scripture do you have that says that you receive the Holy Spirit only? And that question would, would just be equivalent to somebody that's a false teacher in a denominational religion that would ask a Church of Christ member that they claim should already have the knowledge and they will challenge you to see what you know. So it is very important to make sure that you, you study it, you read the answer, mm -hmm. and know where to find it uh, when questions like these uh, come directly to you. So the scripture, just remember, if you're being challenged uh, from somebody that's in the Catholic religion or whatever the case is, just remember to give this scripture here, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. That's the answer. Uh, and we'll read it just, just to uh, prove the point uh, so that that would defeat them with this particular scripture. It's Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and 
verse number 38. The Bible says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, now some, some will say that you don't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If they ask you that, where is the scripture that says that you do receive the Holy Spirit? Because if they don't believe that you receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, then you have to give them the correct answer that would refute that argument that they'll try to make to say that you don't receive the Holy Spirit. And so if they give you a statement without scripture validation, then you give them a scripture that has validity because you can show them, well, this is what it says. And can you explain that? How can you argue with Acts 2.38 because it's been recorded? Amen. They can't argue with you on that because you have proof, because you have shown them the answer in the Bible. And all they can do is just sit and look dumbfounded like, I didn't know that script existed. Yeah. And the reason why you don't believe it exists is because you didn't take the time to read the answer in the Bible. It's in there. You have to look for it. But I just wanted to throw that in there, you know. Uh, right. So just be prepared. That includes myself as well. And I hope I encourage you, you know, to be prepared uh, to be able to uh, look for these answers because God has equipped us with the Bible as a tool. But it is our duty as Christians to study, to read, and be diligent enough to find the answer uh, so that we can always stay ready and prepared to deal with uh, uh, questions that we may find ourselves being challenged with, uh, whether it be saints or a sinner. But questions will come up. So I uh, just wanted to say that. And so... Uh, Moving forward, the day of Pentecost occurred in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. And so now that we have a full recap of what was discussed on last week, I also mentioned various types of baptisms. I mentioned the baptism of Moses, of repentance, of believers, and so, but there are two in particular that I want to deal with uh, on the part two lesson. And one of them is the baptism of Jesus. And the other is the baptism of fire. Uh, because some may say, well, do Jesus have to be baptized being perfect without sin? So we're going to be looking at the book of Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading at verse number 13 of Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 15. The Bible says, Then Jesus came to Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, John knew that Jesus had no sin on him. And he 
couldn't understand what was the need for Jesus to be baptized if, there's, if there was no sin to be repented of. He didn't have any sin. He was sinless. So what was the need for Jesus to be baptized when he was without sin? Well, Jesus wanted John to baptize him, and he, he tells the reason in the next verse. He says, to fulfill all righteousness. But he didn't just include himself. He didn't... Um, mention only himself but he included John as well he says for us to fulfill all righteousness it is befitting for us to fulfill all righteousness mm -hmm. so you can see that there's a connection here you know uh, Jesus you have Jesus baptism and then you have John's uh, baptism um, they are Identical in the sense that being immersed uh, in water, because John he did baptize uh, as well, but the difference is that Jesus, when he comes after John, his baptism would would take on a whole different uh, dimension because. Uh, he says that the one to come after me shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That is the difference uh, in John's baptism and Jesus' baptism. John's baptism is not with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But Jesus' baptism is going to be with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Mm -hmm. that, that's the difference. And so it is to fulfill all righteousness you know fulfillment means to complete you know it's just like when you look at the old testament old testament was filled with with prophecies you know things that would actually uh, come to pass that was going to come into existence uh in the future tense Things that have not happened yet, but it has been prophesied of what is to come. The Old Testament, you know, deals with a lot of prophecies, things that will happen in future tense. And so we look at the scriptures, the fulfillment of prophecy. So that prophecy would not be complete until Jesus dies on the cross uh, for the sins of the whole world. And so then... That would be the fulfillment of the New Testament after the death on the cross. And so that's what it means to fulfill something it means that to complete, to complete. When something is not fulfilled, that means there's a, a prophecy. It is, it is in the process of being completed, but it has not been fulfilled as of yet so something that's not fully completed means that it's in the process in the process mm -hmm. until it's completed that means something else has to happen for the new testament uh, to be complete that means jesus would have to die be buried and resurrected that would fulfill the new testament his death, burial, and resurrection. And so, the baptism of Jesus. Jesus wanted to be baptized because he had to fulfill his Father's will. You know, that was a reason for it. And, you know, John couldn't understand but he was reluctant on wanting to baptize Jesus when Jesus came to him. He didn't want to do it, but Jesus urged him to do it. He saw the necessity uh, for him to be baptized uh, by John. Javier, you have a, a question or a comment? Something? Just a quick comment. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, because he said to fulfill all righteousness, even though Jesus did not have sin. Uh, John's baptism, as Jesus mentioned, he said, is it from heaven or of man? So it came from God and to for John the Baptist is to baptize all men. Right. And so Jesus is both man and God. You know, he's deity, he's the son of God. So the idea is that he's keeping the commandment, Jesus is keeping the commandment that God gave, you know, and which is to be baptized, you know. And so the idea is that he is uh, fulfilling all righteousness, which is his righteous to obey God. So I just want to mention that. Yeah, good, good comment. Anyone else have any comments they want to share? Boot uh, to how the year is coming. Um, yeah, that's right. Because um, if you uh, look at uh, the book of Matthew, chapter uh, 18 of the Great Commission, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, you know, uh, the Bible starts out by saying that. Uh, it says all power, all authority, you know, has been given uh, to me. So we know that the authority, the power comes directly from heaven above. And God is sitting on the throne in heaven. And the son is sitting on the right hand of his father. So that power and authority, God had given that authority to Jesus and we'll read it in Matthew chapter 28 Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 uh, through uh, number 20 it says and Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth so that authority came from his father because he says all authority has been given to me okay given to him by who his father in heaven he's given Jesus that authority but it goes further to say go the go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, this was a commandment by Jesus. Go ye therefore, that is a commandment. He's telling them to do something. He expects action to take place. Just like Jesus will require the sinner to take action to do something, before the verdict would be damnation because he is already damnable by not being in the body of Christ uh, by being lost so brother Henson yeah uh, oh you know God is God is working with God is working with his son and he's working with us as long as we do his will and so the description that you read is that Jesus came down to fulfill our righteousness. Him and John had to do that act to fulfill our righteousness. That's right. So and so and so um, when we look at Colossians uh, two and verse number twelve, it says, "Buried with him in baptism, where he is also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead." So God is working with us. When we're being obedient to his word, he can't work. We're, we're on the borderline of being, God, Christ wasn't sinful, but we're on the borderline of being sinful, going into a faithful relationship. And we've got to continue to go into that faithful relationship based on what God has said. Now he can work with us. But before then, he wasn't working with us. We were against heaven. We were fighting against heaven, everything heaven was about. But as we came into this relationship, now he's working with us as long as we continue to to walk righteously and, and, live, and obey his commandments and live right. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Brother Henson. That's, that's right. an excellent uh, point that he's making. You know, God, God is patient to continue to work with us as long as we are making the effort to, you know, to do uh, 
uh, things according to his will. And wasn't and, he also, I mean, this is just a question, but wasn't he also setting an example for us? Wasn't that part of his perfect example? Amen. Being the perfect example Amen. to us? Do yes. what I do. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Believe what I believe. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Sister Laura. That's, that's a good comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, you know, God is, is continuously uh, working with us, you know, and that's the thing, you know, it's like he, uh, yeah, Sister Laura, yeah, mm -hmm. you don't need it. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I don't want it. You have any comments? No. no. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just, you know, alluding to what Brother Hinson was saying, you know, that, you know, it, it reminds me that um, how God is being patient uh, with sinners, you know, giving them the opportunity to obey, um, obey Him. And, you know, God allows them to continue to, to live and to breathe and to have life in them. Um, and yet, you know, still um, in a sinful state. And so God is, is working with them to, to see if there's going to be a change, you know. And so God expects us to plant the seed and, and to give them the gospel. So that they can obey, uh, you know, because, you know, what they what they have been taught, what they have believed is based on their traditions of what they have, what their parents may have passed down to them when they were younger. And that is something that's been embedded in them from an early age. And that's all they knew, you know, and so it's the same thing uh, with the baptism of repentance. That's all. The Jews heard when John was in the wilderness preaching and they came out to hear his message they didn't hear anything else other than what they were taught by John the Baptist you know and so that was his mission was to teach them the baptism of repentance so they can turn away from their sins before Jesus comes because Jesus has something that he's going to give them uh, but they have to have their sins removed before Jesus can give them uh, what they need. And so it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus, he, he didn't just say the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he included the baptism of fire. Now, that would make you wonder why would he include that uh, when he made that statement the reason the reason being is because Jesus knew that there would be some that would not want to receive the Holy Spirit so he is going to that that baptism of fire will be for those who don't want to receive or to reject um, the Holy Spirit and then he will use the baptism of fire it's a unquenchable fire it is particularly for the disobedient those who disobey him that is a everlasting punishment it's you know if we look at acts chapter 2 because some false religions will try to uh twist uh this script in acts chapter 2 we go back to the day of pentecost acts chapter 2 they would try to say to you, well, Acts chapter 2, what about the speaking of tongues as a fire? See, they could say that. They could say, what about that? Is that the same kind of fire that Jesus was talking about that he would uh, baptize with the Holy Spirit and, and with fire? Is that the same fire on the day of Pentecost when they were speaking in tongues? So let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we look at verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with 
one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Now they would say, well, is that the same type of fire that Jesus is going to bring for those who disobey him? Um, no, this is not the same type of fire. This, this, is, this, is a, this, is a, this is in the sense of a metaphor. You know, that's what the tongues were like as a fire. This is a metaphor uh, speaking here in this particular verse. The, the baptism of fire, this is not the literal fire that Jesus is talking about that he will come to baptize those who are disobedient with fire. This is not the same type of fire. The fire that Jesus is referring to is damnation, eternal damnation. You know, for those who disobey him and, and refuse to receive uh, the Holy Spirit because you know we have the Holy Spirit we all have it the same spirit can we get to heaven without having God's spirit in us no we cannot we cannot because if Jesus wouldn't give us his spirit because Jesus is the only one that can guide us and he can help guide us in how we can get to heaven and he tells us in the bible you know we have scriptures uh look at john chapter 14 Look at verse 1. It says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it would not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, uh, do you not know where you are going? And, he, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, you know, we can't, we can't determine if we get to heaven or not, you know, because we don't have, you know, we didn't actually uh, establish uh, the kingdom of heaven. You know, that was established by, by God himself, you know, and so we don't make that determination if we get to heaven or not. You know, God requires us to be obedient. Be obedient and, and Jesus will take care of the rest. We just need to do our part as a Christian you know, to do diligence, to be obedient, you know, when opportunities present itself, we need to take advantage of it to try to, you know, bring lost souls to Christ. Do what we can do, and God will take care of the rest. He'll take care of the rest, you know. So we don't make that determination uh, if we, you know, get to heaven. Only Jesus, uh, because he will be the ultimate judge. Uh, to make that decision, uh, if we enter in the, the, uh, the eternal life, or we find ourselves uh, in turn, eternal damnation. So, uh, okay, Javier. Thank you, brother. Uh, great, great comment, great lesson, brother. I just want to just want to add that. Um, 
you know, when it comes to the fire, uh, be baptized in fire is dealing with, because a lot of denominations, they'll teach that, uh, you know, you've got to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire, you know, um, thinking that it's some type of spiritual thing when it comes to the fire. Um, now, the context of, um, there's different contexts of fire, like, for example, when you look at um, the Mark chapter 9, verse 49, for everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted uh, with salt. So if you look at, if you go back to Mark chapter 9, let me see if uh, verse 48, Mark 9, 48, I want to look at that verse as well. Uh, the Bible says, for their worm died not, and the fire is not quenched. Okay, we know that's talking about hell. Yes. Right? And it says, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace uh, one with, with another. And so when it comes to the fire that was on the... Uh, the bush, the burning bush, it was, the Bible says it was burning it, but it wasn't consuming it. Amen. So what God did was he made a fire that wouldn't consume um, the bush. And so when you look at uh, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21, it says, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. And then it's the same scripture in Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So in doing that, giving the enemy drink, thirst, heap coals of fire on his head, that's dealing with uh, there's a shame or remorse that comes with it because remember he's an enemy. He, his mind towards you is is to for evil, and so when it comes to you doing him good, the coals of fire go on his head. The shame, the remorse, uh, because he knows what good is, he knows what evil is, but his mind is already set on evil towards you. So when you do that, it pours, it heaps coals of fire uh, on his head. Uh, because of the shame and the remorse that comes from uh, doing him good, you know the the shame that comes with man. He just he has to pause and and and, and you know look at his thoughts and, and see who he is and or she is, and but it, it's the shame that comes with it, you know. And so you also have in um, the Bible says that Jesus will come down in flame of fire. We know that's actual fire, but it won't consume Christ and it won't consume the angels. And, but that's actual fire. And so then you have the lake of fire where they're going to be placed into. It's actual fire, but their soul is still going to be suffering forever. So I just wanted to give a different context um, uh, concerning fire and how the Bible uses it. Mm -hmm. was, um, uh, any more comments? Anyone else has any comments uh, they want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to look at... Uh, Another scripture alluding to what Javier just come in about. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, which is what he alluded to about uh, Jesus would come in, in flame and fire. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter, uh, no, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse and number 8. 2 Thessalonians, uh, forgive me for that mistake uh, the second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 it says in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ so that flaming fire it, it shows that Jesus is going to have this this anger. He's going to come angry, you know. So this is the vengeance that he's going to take on those who do not know him 
and that have not obeyed uh, him as well. This is going to be uh, their reward, but it's not a good reward for the disobedient. You know, he's going to be angry because they choose not to obey. But he said, it says he's going to take vengeance, you know, and so this is a, a repay. Repay for all that the sins they have, you know, the everything they have done that's that's not good, you know, he's going to take vengeance. And so the good thing is that we don't take it upon ourselves to take vengeance on, on against people that do us wrong, you know. Because that should be reserved for God, you know, in the end, he's going to take vengeance. And so God takes notice of those things of how we're being mistreated as Christians on this earth. You know, and I know sometimes, you know, our human nature can get the best of us. We want to, we want to, you know, take vengeance back and say, nah, I'm not going out like that. You know, I'm gonna, I got to do something to get back at this person, you know. Then it doesn't make you any better than the person that did you wrong. Because you are lowering your, your, your character as a Christian to be equal to that person that that's did you wrong. And so the Christian has to rise above that because, you know, Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. But he says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. So there's some things... Um, that's not really worth even allowing yourself to put yourself in that in that frame mind, you know, because we have we supposed to have the mind of Christ, you know, and we can't have the same mindset that those that are calling minded that are in the world uh, think about things, and we have to allow ourselves to not be conformed. As Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but we must be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so when your mind is renewed, you have the mind of Christ. You have his thoughts. And when you have his thoughts, it's being displayed in your actions or how you treat, you know, the enemy. So the Bible always gives us an answer on how we are to deal with certain situations, whether it's uh, somebody that do us wrong. It tells us to pray for them, pray for those who uh, spitefully use you. But this scripture is speaking in terms of, of vengeance that God's going to take out on those who are disobedient uh, to him that have not obeyed uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, but that is the lesson. Um, are there any final comments before I close the lesson out? Anyone? Um, Brother Henson. And you can close us out uh, when you finish your, your comment. Uh, I, I just want to apologize for the hotel, for the, for the temperature man. in the room. And so you know, you can give it to uh, Ozan has a brother brother Ozan. I just want to no, know. No, I'm sorry. I thought he had. I'm sorry. No. Laura, you had. I thought Javier had a Sister so, so, Laura, you had your hand up. Oh, yeah. You had something you wanted to say. That was you. I was thinking that. You know what? Okay. I'll close it. You and Javier were saying that he just pulled on himself when yes. he was trying to get the truth. When you um, behave as a Christian. You know, Christ like for those who um, despitefully use you or right. hate you. And the coals that you guys referenced. Heaping coals. That he's heaping you. coals. But I noticed that there's also another side to those coals in the sense that there's salvation in those coals in that they can sand or prick the heart of that same person. And cause him to turn around, to go down in the watery grave. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Those it same coals, quote unquote coals, can be a man's salvation because they can prick the heart. So I know that they burn, they can burn one way or the other, you know? 
I don't know if I'm saying it right, but well, um, good can come out of it. Well, you know that uh, a person that, that, that hasn't obeyed the gospel and they die in that state, uh -huh. they die lost. And so the, the outcome for that person would be eternal damnation. They're going to spend eternity in hell. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier that some people can, you know, it just shows how easy a person can misquote or uh, misapply a scripture. Like I've mentioned, Acts 2, there's a lot of scripture that deals with fire, but they can misinterpret it uh, to make it mean something else. Like the, the, the tongues as a fire, that's, that's, um, that's metaphorically speaking, you know, just like what the tongues were like. But it, it doesn't, it's not equivalent to the fire that Jesus is referring to when he says the Holy Spirit and with fire. Like, that's a different type of fire. It's not the same one that Jesus is referring to. The one he's referring to would be uh, um, unquenchable, which means it's everlasting. There's no comfort. It's going to be continual. Right. That's and Javier just Fondo mentioned Fondo earlier that uh, <laughs> you know be consumed. So Jesus is going to make sure it's going to be enough fire to where you know they're going to be drenched in it, but it's going to be a continual uh, discomfort. So He knows how to bring just enough to where it's going to be unpleasant uh, for those who are, who die lost. Mm -hmm. You know everlasting uh, punishment. Mm -hmm. So that's that's you know the difference there. Right. Thank you, that's the fire we're all trying to avoid. Amen. <laughs> I want to read uh, uh it says in Matthew five forty three, ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and send it rain on the just and on the unjust. For if we love them which love you, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And so that word reward have you, you go to Proverbs 25, it says, verse 21, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So it mentions okay. reward again. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to righteousness, see, the reward is because you, your attributes are like the Father. That's how the Father is. He gives to the good and to the evil. And so verse 47, And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than the others? Do not even the public and so. Be therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is uh, is perfect. And so that's how you get perfected when you obey this, these scriptures, these attributes concerning how to treat your enemy. And then when you go back to Romans 12, it says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing. So it says, For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire uh, on his head. So when it comes to... Uh, the shame that comes with it when it comes to the the characteristics of God that they see in you. Uh, that's what causes the remorse. That's what causes the... And so not everyone that you... that uh, That's an enemy that you feed and and give water to is going to go to hell. Right. You know, because some of them are going to repent. Because he remember, it says pray for your enemy. Right. Some of those prayers are going to get heard. Some of them are going to repent. Amen. And so... There's many times in the Bible where enemies turn into brethren, Amen. you know, and so that's what the uh, the good does. It, it 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 causes you to now look in the mirror at yourself, and then feel that 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 shame or that that uh, regret of you know doing a sin or to a person that you seen as your enemy, and so um, that's what they had in Acts chapter two. Men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, Peter told him, hey, you guys, you crucified the Lord. You know, he said, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, they were very uh, sorrowful. A lot of the Jews were sorrowful because 
they they were like ashamed of what they did, and um, and they changed that day. They, they were enemies, and then they became uh, brethren afterwards. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Sister Lauren, for your comment. Thank you, Chris. You want any other final comments? You want? No. Okay, brothers. That's the class, and thank you for everyone for commenting. Uh, also, the comments and, and thoughts that were shared. And um, so, we're going to go ahead and end it right here uh, so somebody can close us out uh, with a prayer.